gave a little bit of a commentary on it, which I'll just sum up briefly now. My experience with police officers, and just to be clear, I am not a blanket, the police don't have any problems, let's gloss over it, I'm a big fan. We of stipulate that there are some bad officers. I stipulate completely there are significant problems in policing in America, there's no doubt about that. The reason I believe, given my experience with police officers in New York City and working in a heavily minority precinct, 90% black and Hispanic, the 7-5 precinct in East New York, Brooklyn, is now, according to some friends I talked to, and my experience in the beginning a little bit, is a white police officer understands in a use of force interaction with a black subject that even if he follows the use of force guidelines to a T, his actions are going to be scrutinized from a racial lens, not from a legal one. So he hesitates to use force in that situation to try and back himself or herself out of it to avoid the legal, tangle, uh, legal entanglements later. I can't tell you how many friends of mine who have cops still to this day who are still involved in policing who have said if they wave to you for help, wave back and keep going. Because you are going to get, if, I, I kid, I'm not making this up, these are real things told to me. Wave and keep going unless it's a radio run because the minute you get involved, the cell phone camera comes out and all of a sudden you're the bad guy no matter what you do. That should tell you what's in their heads when they're out there dealing in a situation that might potentially involve... But isn't that an argument for body cams? Uh, it could be. I mean, I think body cams are a more complicated mm -hmm. issue. We, you know, we don't have the time to wrap up here, but I think the first question you should ask yourself with body cam is, you know, do you have the right to make that footage go away? Everybody thinks, about, oh, you're policing the cops. I don't want to be on your body cam. I mean, there are libertarian issues there from your perspective as well. It's not a simple issue. Mr. Mm, Mr. Bon I don't know, but you have the state sanctioned right to kill people. Go ahead. Mr. Yeah. Bongino, I'd like to finish with a few minutes discussing the Ferguson study that concluded the Ferguson PD was institutionally racist. Their biggest finding was that Ferguson is 67% black, 85% of the traffic stops were of black motorists, an 18-point gap. New York City has 25% blacks. Roughly 55% of the traffic stops are black people. That's a 30-point gap, as opposed to an 18-point gap. Yet Ferguson, which is mostly white, is called institutionally racist, yet the NYPD, the majority of the street cops are people of color, is not. Can you explain the difference? Why is one called institutionally racist even though the gap is just 18 points, NYPD has a gap of 30 points yet it, and, and is um, mostly, mostly uh, people of color, whereas the one with the smaller percentage, almost all white. One would have thought that people would have called the NYPD far more institutionally racist than Ferguson, but they don't. Why not? Because there was money to be made in propagandizing what happened in Ferguson for groups interested um, not in racial diversity or racial harmony, but racial strife. Uh, folks, listen, racial strife is big business. Uh, creating the perception that there's a mass systemic problem of, uh, you know, post-Jim Crow mass racism in America has sadly turned into big business. Ferguson was very profitable for some groups that needed to propagandize the situation and make it out to be a, a, a obviously, it was a straight use of force scenario. It was clear as day by the guidelines, and they needed to make that situation look worse than it really was because it was a money-making endeavor. And selling Ferguson as a racist city and keeping that going keeps these groups in business that sponsor some of these studies, put these research reports out, and want you on their email list and conveniently hit you up for money afterwards. Last quick question. Would you also say, Mr. Bongino, that this perception, this misperception, is exactly why an individual named O.J. Simpson brutally murdered two people and walked? I think that's a deep question. Listen, I think O.J. was guilty, but man, I don't know what the hell they were thinking letting him go. I'm, I'm, I just don't know. Miscarriage of justice. Oh, yeah, no question, but what they were thinking. No further questions, Your Honor. Your witness, Major. Oh, you let you sit up here anyway, didn't I? <laughs> I try to disqualify you as an expert witness, but we're good. We're good. So, Mr. Bongino. Yes, sir. Thanks for taking time out to be here. You getting paid, by the way? Uh, Don't answer that. I'm, I'm sorry. That's man, it. I wish you all, check it. With, I'd love with, to take it. If with, with you all the question. <laughs> Dr. Benjamin Franklin, do you know who that is? Of course. You know, he's got a, a, a pretty famous quote. Well, first of all, before I get to that, how do you feel about the Constitution of the United States? 
You know, that's a funny question. Because the fact that you have to ask it's interesting. Because nobody should give a rat's ass how I feel about the Constitution. Because it was written with the idea that this is the law no matter how you think about it. I love the Constitution. It's the greatest governing document in human history. But the greatest part about the Constitution is my opinion doesn't matter. It's written clear as day for people like us to understand. Now back to Dr. Benjamin Franklin. Uh, <laughs> we may be related, I'm not sure, but that's for another conversation or... So, he talks about liberty, and he talks about safety, and he says pretty much those who sacrifice liberty for a little bit of safety deserve neither. Do you agree with that? Absolutely, unequivocally. Okay. We've got a couple of wars that are going on in this country, one being the war on drugs and one being the war on terror. Um, let's start with the war on drugs and that policy. And as you heard earlier, you were seated here, you weren't sequestered from the courtroom. And we talked about uh, who enforces these laws. And there was also some comments about how law enforcement tends to lobby. There was a question about who makes our laws. But a big part of that process is about lobbying for those laws to be made or upheld or, or so they continue, right? Mm -hmm. Do you believe that law enforcement carries a lot of weight when it comes to lobbying for laws in this country? They do. Okay. I don't necessarily agree I, with that. that. That's good. Okay. But they do. They do. Okay. I appreciate your, your honesty here and your answer regarding that. Your Honor, now, I, the I would war like on, him to allow the witness to answer the question fully, <laughs> thoroughly. It was just a yes or no response. And he said he does. That's well, he wanted yes to amplify the answer. You didn't like the answer, so you cut it off. <laughs> your Honor. Please. Next question, please. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> so, how do you feel about the war on drugs? Um, you know, this is a, these laws are about consensual adult behavior, like prostitution, and I think we're in one of those states where prostitution is kind of a little different, right? Because maybe some people have realized some I don't think it's different, but, I just think it's legal. Well, Trust me, it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that I'm sure of. Yes. Not that I have any experience, but I'm pretty sure. Okay. Can you use PayPal? I didn't even ask I, I think Bitcoin, whatever. Venmo? It's all good. Yeah. yeah. Let Asking me get my questions. <laughs> Go ahead. So these are laws about consensual adult behavior. How do you feel about laws of consensual adult behavior? And, and what do you think? Should well, they be or should they not be? You know, it's interesting. when At Mark, Freedom Fest here. You know? Yeah, when Mark and I were going back and forth and Valerie had asked me to come out, I said, you know, I, I'm obviously a big proponent of supporting our police officers when, when they deserve it, which is often. But I'm not a big fan of the war on drugs. So this is where I don't fit into a box on this. You know, it's a mock trial, but these are very serious issues, and I appreciate the question. And I, just quickly, I remember as a police officer being a rookie in the 3-2 precinct in Harlem and arresting a kid for smoking a joint in the middle of the day. And I, I, I'm not trying to sell your book, I, pr I promise, but there's a little, little more detail in there. But I wrote about it in my first book because it impacted my life so deeply because I never forgot that kid. And I thought, gosh, he was 16. He now has an arrest on his record for smoking a joint in the street. Bad decision. Gosh, I make bad decisions every day. Mm -hmm. And his life is probably over right about now. And I kind of never forgave myself for that. So I think the war on drugs is more complicated than the 10 right. seconds we have left. Okay. But I, some of your points I'll concede that it is probably misguided in some, okay. in some ways. I'm almost done. Thank you. We're so Don't close, clap, you guys. Clap, you, clap. <laughs> you know I hate the war on drugs, so we're almost finished. So, if the police, if we didn't have the war on drugs, if it was handled by healthcare practitioners, sure. okay, pr pr predominantly, and police were pretty much about murder, rape, robbery, finding our missing children, burglaries, those things that really matter, I know, to everybody. Right. If that was the job of the police, how do you think relationships between the police and any community would be? Better or worse? Yeah, I, I think it would be better. It would take 
a certain amount of ad the adversarial nature of police versus community out of it. But you have to remember, as uh, you know, the, the captain said, and accurately so, uh, we're, we're talking about the, you know, the fireman line. At some point, and Kennedy mentioned as well, you have the power to take a life and take freedom. Those are two inherently unpopular decisions whenever they're going to be used and whether there's a war on drugs or not. And I stipulate some of your points. There are still going to be times when you're going to be extremely unpopular with the person wearing the Smith & Wesson handcuffs. Right. Final question. Final answer. If you were a police leader... Well, wait for the question. <laughs> if you were a police leader today... Yes. Would you advocate, lobby, would you adv advocate for a change in policies that undoubtedly create a rift, distance between you 